I have a very difficult topic to, to talk about tonight, so I'm going to need you to really help think things out with me. It's a very complicated topic. I sent Rabbi Shaman and Rabbi Barry 17 choices of topics, and the one topic I hope they wouldn't have chosen was this one. Because my original topic was called Rambam, Spinoza, and Us. So they reworded it to leave Spinoza out. But I'm going to start with Spinoza. I want to start with Spinoza for a very special reason. As was mentioned, I'm a rabbi emeritus. I was rabbi for 38 years at Congregation Sheriff Israel in New York. Sheriff Israel, as you probably know, was founded in 1654. It's the oldest Jewish congregation in North America. It's a Spanish and Portuguese synagogue, meaning the founders were Jews who lived in Spain and Portugal, or whose ancestors lived in Spain and Portugal, as Jews who had converted to Catholicism under pressure came out of Spain and Portugal during the 1500s or early 1600s and went to Amsterdam. And then, during the 1600s, found their way to the New World, first to Brazil, and then in 1654 to New Amsterdam. Two years after our congregation was founded, in the year 1656, there was a young man in Amsterdam, our mother congregation, by the name of Baruch Spinoza, who was excommunicated from the community in Amsterdam. He was excommunicated for good reason. He was a good official apikores, for sure, by all definitions. He was a heretic, he didn't believe in our religion, he had a lot of problems, and they excommunicated him. That was their decision. But here's my fantasy. My fantasy is, if Spinoza, at age 22, let's say when he was just 1650, in 1654, if he would have come to New Amsterdam, instead of staying in Amsterdam, he would have been a member of my synagogue. <laughs> <laughs> and if the Almighty had wished it, and put me back in history, I could have been Spinoza's rabbi. And one day, God should give me strength, I want to write a book called Spinoza's Rabbi. How would I deal with this man? Here's a man who is a beautiful person, grew up in our community, learned Torah from the best rabbis we had, was from a traditional family, everything looked beautiful. But, in his mind, he became little mixed up, as we would call it, with philosophy, with the current critique of the church, the Bible. And Spinoza, oddly enough, as a 24-year-old outcast from the Jewish community, became the most influential thinker in Europe. It's amazing. To the Jews, he was an outcast. To the Christians, he was a Jew. He had no money, no status, no position, no university share, nothing. And plus, he didn't even write that much during his lifetime that was published. So this little, quiet nobody, an excommunicated Jew, who became a, a lens grinder, and lived in a very simple way, became the most seminal thinker, not just in Europe at that time, but probably changed the whole history of modern philosophy. Now what would be, if this gentleman, very intelligent young man, mild-mannered, beautiful man, from everything he wrote, he was a serene we would have liked him. We would have liked him very much. Let's say he was a member of my congregation, of my community. And he came to me with his questions. Could I have answered him? Or how would I have answered him? Well, it's a very, it always bothers me, this question. I want to go a little further with it. We have very little information about what really triggered his problem with the community in Amsterdam. But from the things that we have, there are some anecdotal things. For example, his father was a businessman and there was a pious old lady, Jewish lady, who owed the father some money. So the father sent Baruch Spinoza, who was then a teenager, to go collect this debt. So he went to this lady's house and she's all pious and everyone in the community knows she's a tzedeket. And when she gives this boy the money, she somehow or other has a hole in the, her table so that she drops some of the money over that she che- tries to cheat him. It looks like he's, he's paid, let's say she, she owed a hundred coins. She ended up giving him eighty coins. And the others she was able to hide or suppress. So Spinoza was a very smart young man, a very shrewd businessman. And he said, what about the other twenty coins that you didn't give me? Oh, very well. Right. She, she had to pay him. So he came back to his father and says, Father, this is our religion. Here's a woman who's so pious and she tried to cheat me. It's a little story. 
Does it matter would a person really leave the religion because they came across one bad case? I don't know. But another case. He was in class and he had good teachers. The rabbis he had were really intelligent people. <coughs> and he asked questions. And the questions he asked weren't just uh, simple questions. They were difficult questions. He was obviously very, had a very um, piercing mind, very penetrating mind. So the rabbis, for whatever reason, told him, you can't ask those questions. We don't want to hear those questions. They're disruptive. They'll confuse the other students. What could have happened, let's say I were Spinoza's rabbi, I would have taken them after, listen, those are wonderful questions. They're very tough questions. I don't want to discuss them in the whole class because they'll get everyone mixed up. But let's have a little private shiurim and we'll see if I can straighten you out. But they didn't do that. And the more questions he asked and the less answers he got, it wasn't just that he didn't get answers. He, the answer that was... We don't want to hear your questions. Maybe if someone would have said, let's listen to what this guy has to say. Let's try to answer, even if we can't answer. Maybe, I don't know, maybe he would have stayed in the fold. Spinoza was a, the arch-rationalist of the modern times. He, com- he believed all knowledge could be attained by reason. Anything that could not be attained by reason was not knowledge. You don't have to rely on it. And his proof was, interestingly enough, a very religious argument. He said, God created us, or God, we're endowed by God with reason. And God would not have given us that power unless we were supposed to use it. And he didn't give us any other powers. He didn't think about prophecy. We're not all prophets. He didn't think we have any mystical insights that can't be proven by logic. So everything that we could find out only can be found out through logic. So if we just think straight, think logically, we'll be able to obtain truth with a capital T. Now that's not a religious view, interestingly enough. Why? Because we believe there's something that transcends reason and logic. Logic can only carry us so far. And then, that no matter how reasonable you're going to be, it's very, very hard to prove that God gave us a Torah, that God gave us a tradition, that we're supposed to follow the misfold. All of these things, are, of course, they're 100% true with a capital T. But to prove that by reason, it's very difficult. What, how do we prove it? by our tradition, it was passed on from generation to generation, by our belief in prophecy, there was a revelation, and prophets from all the generations have told us this. So we feel comfortable because of tradition and because of prophecy. But Spinoza deleted both of those things from his list of truth. How do we know truth? Through our reason. Wherever reason would lead us, that's where we're going to be able to determine as truth. So now I have Spinoza in my class in 1654, Sheriff Israel. And the guy comes that way, and I said, well listen, you know what we should do? The most reasonable person that I know in our whole tradition is none other than the Rambam. Spinoza, by the way, studied Rambam. He, I don't know if he studied it right. He didn't study with me. But he, he did study the Rambam. And he rejected the Rambam in many ways. One of the great st- students of, of Rambam in our generation is a man named David Hartman. He lives in Israel. He heads the, the Hartman Institute, Shalom Hartman Institute in, in Jerusalem. And in one of his books, which I've got to bring up closer so I can see it, um, it's called Maimonides, Torah and Philosophic Quest. He tries to understand how does Rambam, who is our classic example of a rationalist thinker, how does he deal with blending the Torah and the philosophical quest? Here's our problem. Here's our problem. You know what the, our greatest nightmare is as rabbis and as people? Spinoza. Greatest nightmare that we have. Why? We all want our children and grandchildren to be good Jews. We want them to follow the traditions, to follow our ways, to follow the ways of our ancestors of the past 3,000 years. We don't want anyone to veer from our general path. We're willing to recognize a little bit, you know, I always say everyone wants their kids to come out either 10% this way or 10% that way. But that's the range. We don't want them to come 70% that way and 70% that way. We want them generally like us within a general range. Spinoza is off the charts. And we don't want Spinoza. We don't want our kids or grandchildren to be Spinoza. Or like that. Well, how are we going to prevent that? Do we recognize that there is a world outside of the Jewish people and there are other people who posit other kinds of truth? So Hartman examines that question. He said there are four ways of trying to deal with the world of Torah and the world of philosophy. 
Four ways only. Number one, the way of insulation. Insulation, what does that mean? We have a truth, they don't. Since what we have is true, we don't need their knowledge. Anything the world has to say is not relevant to us. Our kids should not learn anything that we don't teach them from our, within our own tradition. Because once we introduce them to other ideas, other cultures, other civilizations, other religions, we're going to lose a certain percentage of them. Maybe we'll lose a big percentage of them. The best thing to do is have hot house plants. Protect them. Put them in insulated areas. Don't let them have access to outside information. Don't let them go to the internet. Don't let them read books. Except the books that you select for them. You can, they let you read art scroll, I think. That, that's permissible for them. <laughs> but that's it. That's it. That's an approach. That's an approach, by the way, which I think is a, taken by many Jews today. Which we've been discussing over also, but I'm not going to hammer that home again anymore. But there's logic to it. If your goal in life is to make sure your kid isn't Spinoza, which I call every Jewish parent's nightmare, you've got to do something to ensure that that won't happen. And one way to do that is to make sure they don't have any exposure to anyone who might think a different kind of thought. Just brainwash them. Literally speaking, brainwash them. Tell them the outside world is bad, they're horrible, they're sinners, they're goyim, they're reformed, they're, they're whatever you want to say to them. And xenophobia to the world outside. That's the way of insulation. And there's logic to it, even though I personally think it's a repulsive answer. Second, the way of dualism. Dualism means we compartmentalize. There's one world called our ideas, the way we think. And there's another world called the way we act. So as long as we act in our society, we do all the misvote, we dress the right dress, we walk the right walk, we talk the right talk, we look religious. We follow what everyone else in the community does. Okay, what I think is my business. I can think this way, I can think that way. As long as it doesn't impinge on the way I act and anybody else's act, we live in two worlds. Our brain is one world. Our spiritual life, our intellectual life is one way. And the way we live, we conform to the society in which we live and which we want to flourish. So as far as our kids are concerned, they see us doing everything right. So they'll learn from us, they'll do everything right. What do we care? How we think. They don't need to know how we think. I had a professor when I was at Yeshiva, who was an Orthodox rabbi, <clears throat> and a professor of literature. And he used to make this as a virtue. He says, boys, he called us boys, even though we were already in the 20s, but in those days they, called, they could get away with that kind of language. He says, boys, I'm a compartmentalized Jew. In the morning, I'm a rabbi. I'm a, I learn Talmud, I learn Rambam, I learn Poskim. That's what I am. But when I teach English literature, I'm not a rabbi. I am a literary man, I'm a professor, and I study all the literary ideas like everybody else studies them. And being a rabbi has nothing whatsoever to do with this. I'm two different people. In the morning, I'm a Jew. In the afternoon, I'm a professor of literature. And he was so proud that he was able to compartmentalize. Well, he could do it. I guess. I don't know. It's a little neurotic. Uh, he still is neurotic <laughs> at this age. Uh, it's a hard thing to do, but it's, it's a, hard, a difficult lifestyle to, to advocate. It's a defensive one. Maybe some people can do it, but it's not something you could advocate as a public uh, philosophy. You don't say it's my ideal. My ideal is, folks, do walk the walk, talk the talk, and think the way you want to think. There can't be a disjoint between the way we think and the way we act. There should be a harmony in our lives. The third way is the way that Spinoza chose, called the way of rejection. Rejection is this. I see the Torah on one side. On the other side I see philosophy, history, psychology, anthropology, science, cosmology. And you know what? The weight of truth seems to be on the other side, not on the side of Torah. And therefore, look, I put the Torah aside, and I follow those things. That's what we don't want the answer to be. But some people, once you give them the access to all this other knowledge... They could in fact go that particular direction. And the fourth way, says Professor Hartman, is called the way of integration. What does integration mean? It means take the Torah, take general wisdom, integrate them, which isn't an easy thing to do, study them both, and then from that process you're going to be a better person. And he says that's Rambam's approach, integration. Well, that's also risky. But let me, I'm going to go back to my high school days. When I took Algebra 3, we had a teacher, and he gave us problems. 
You know, it's very complicated problems. And he gave us right next to the problem, he gave us the answer. Right? Maybe you all took courses like that. You already had the answer. So what was the challenge? The challenge is to take these all these these, these uh, equations and whatever the x, y's and z's and multiply them and divide them and find the square roots of them and make sure at the end of all the process of three pages of, of calculations you got that answer. What happens if you did all the calculations and you got a different answer? You're wrong. So you got to go back again and start. Where did I make the mistake? I like to use that analogy in the way we study Torah. Spinoza would have said, we have a problem and we don't have the answer. There's no answer. And what happens, we do the calculations, wherever we end, that's the answer. The Raman says, we do know the answer. We have T with the ca- truth with a capital T. The answer is there. Torah, tradition, revelation, we already have the answers. The only thing is, we don't know how to get to that answer. We don't understand the answer. Okay? Work, think, reason. Use your reason to the maximum, and you will finally reach that maximum T. The Raman discusses the following in the Moran Uchim. He said there are many people who he calls ignoramuses, by the way. He's not sh- uh, shy to use very strong language when he, he wants to. He calls them ignoramuses of the law. They're individuals who like to skip the steps. They say, if I know the right answer, what do I have to do the calculations for? Mine is not to reason why. Mine is to do or die. I have the answer. It's good enough for me. Raman considers these people ignoramuses. Because the purpose of the Torah isn't just to do misvote. The purpose of the Torah is to understand why I'm doing the misvot. Ah, if God's divine wisdom is going to always be past my ability to understand the truth? Yes. You're never going to understand God's wisdom. But you can come close or closer. Your job as a thinking Jew is to try to understand as best as you can. To do the calculations as best as you can to get to this capital T. If you fall short, okay, but you've tried. So what's the advantage of going through all the calculations? The advantage is because it teaches you how to think. It lets you know that when God gave us the Torah, He didn't give us misvot just to, to do things that are foolish. God, according to the Ramam, every misvah has one of two purposes. Either to improve our bodies or to improve our souls. It means it has, it's politically sensible, the misvah, to create a better society or it's to create a better human being. Become more righteous, we have better beliefs, we have better compassion for people. So the very process of trying to think these things out helps us become better in serving God. And if we don't do that process, according to the Rambam, we're deficient as Jews. We're ignoramuses in the law. We follow the letter of the law, but we don't haven't integrated the, the philosophical truths that must go with it. Now our goal is to is to pursue truth and not to be, be simple-minded about it. The Rambam has the following problem. There are things in the Torah which clearly conflict with reason. And the Rambam believed, interestingly, very much like Spinoza, that God gave us reason, and the reason is not a flawed instrument. Reason is a limited instrument. It can't reach beyond a certain point. But reason is not flawed. God gave us a, an ability to understand things. And God didn't deceive us by giving us a mind that misleads us. If we're able to use our minds correctly, according to our capacity, we can come to truth with a capital T. So he, I'm not saying that both of them were good rationalists. The difference between Rambam and Spinoza, I like to say, I don't know if it's true or not, I think it's true, is that for, the, for Spinoza, the ideal human being is a philosopher who has an intellectual love of God. For Rambam, the ideal person is the prophet. Because the prophet is not only a philosopher, but he goes one step further. He not only perceives God intellectually, but he's experienced God's presence. That's the difference, it seems to me. So Ramam understands reason could carry us up to the level of prophecy, but to really get to God, you're going to need God's help and become a prophet. For example, the Torah says, Adonai Ish Milchama, God is a man of war. God has Yad Chazaka. God has a strong arm. Israel Nituya. God stretches out his arm. Well, if you're a philosopher, you don't believe anything I just told you. Because God isn't a man. God doesn't have an arm. God doesn't have a hand. Philosophers believe God, and I think we all believe, God is incorporeal. God has nothing to do with body. God has nothing to do with emotions. God transcends all of these things. 
And yet the Torah is full of that language. So how does Ramam solve the problem? Anybody know? Metaphors. There's a symbol of poetic language. He brought Torah to the Adam. The Torah speaks in human terms as poetic language. You have to understand it poetically. It's an image. It's as though God has a hand. It's as though God has a heart. It's as though God loves us. We feel that. But it's not because it's really so. It's not so. There's, there's a poetic language. Spinoza, by the way, didn't like Rambam's. He considered that a cop-out. He considered Rambam cheating. Because whenever Rambam came across something that wasn't co- didn't conform to reason, Rambam said, well, the Torah doesn't mean that. I can explain it another way. But the Rambam was emphatic, and he was criticized harshly for that, by the way, and saying re- reason is such a good tool that whenever the Torah itself conflicts with reason, we have to reinterpret the Torah to conform with reason. Very strong statement. Very, very strong statement. He was also carrying the same principle to the words of our sages. Uh, the words of our sages were, of course, we call them sages because they were smart, they were sages. Many times, the Chachamim, they say, God wears a talet. I don't know if it's a Sephardi talet or Ashkenazi talet. God wears tefillin. <laughs> Rabbeinu Tama Rashi, I don't know. But it's a, it's a God, and, and uh, they refer to God in very human terms. With emotions, with body parts, and among other things. They also say other things that are very strange. So the Rambam says as follows. There are different ways of understanding these particular passages. One group, he says, they're very foolish people. I'll come back to the fools later. One group is a cynical people. They see when our sages say things that don't conform to reason, they say our sages weren't reasonable, therefore we're not going to listen to our sages. That's the way of rejection. There's another group, which he calls fools, who take the words of our sages literally. Just as he reinterprets the Bible to conform to reason, he says we have to understand that the sages were wise people, they don't speak unreasonably. If you find something that doesn't conform to philosophy or to reason, we have to reinterpret it. So for example, he says there's a group of people who take all Midrashim as being literally true. We don't know such people anymore, right? This is only in the Middle Ages. Here's what he says, the Ramah says. This group of impoverished understanding, one must pity their foolishness. According to their understanding, they are honoring and elevating our sages. In fact, they are lowering our sages to the end of lowliness. They do not even understand this. By heaven, this group is dissipating the glory of the Torah and clouding its lights, placing the Torah of God opposite of its intention. I couldn't have said it better myself. People who are trying to defend foolish statements, not, they're not foolish statements, the statements which appear foolish, and they defend it literally, these people are actually not giving honor to our Chachamim, they're making our Chachamim look like ignoramuses. Because why should Chachamim say things that are nonsense? What does Ramam say? He says what we should do is understand that since our Chachamim were smart, if they're saying something that seems not so smart, they have, they speak, they're speaking in illusions, they're speaking poetically. What's the hidden meaning? What's the, why do they talk in that language? And then when you understand it that way, the words of Chachamim don't turn out to be foolish at all, they turn out to be wise. Sometimes the Chachamim really had it wrong and the Ramam admits it. For example, they had things wrong on, on scientific facts. They admit the Greeks had it better than, they knew better than the Chachamim on certain scientific facts. Once in a while the Chachamim were wrong. If the Chachamim gave medical advice, don't listen to them, go to your doctor. They, had, they believed in certain things we don't necessarily believe in. They believe in, in Shadim. We don't have to believe in Shadim. It's not a, uh, an aspect of our faith we have to accept. Unless you want to be a literalist. And you heard what Rambam says about literalists. Therefore, the Rambam is trying to create a construct where we trust our reason, where we follow our reason as far as it can go, and when we find anything in the Torah or in the words of our sages that conflicts with reason, we have to give precedence to reason. We have to reinterpret or reclassify what we've studied via the dictates of reason. Now, you know what? I, I agree with them. That's great. I love you. Rambam, right on. Brilliant. One thing is, that's very scary what I just said. If you listen to what the Rambam says carefully, how do you know you're not going to produce the next generation Spinoza? Rambam is giving so much power to reason 
He's saying, and if you come across something you think it doesn't make sense, you reinterpret it. I can let anyone who wants reinterpret the Torah. They'll say, you know, Shabbat is only an allegory. It doesn't really mean the real Shabbat. Honoring your mother and father doesn't mean really honor your living mother and father. It means some spiritual idea of motherhood and fatherhood. They can change every mitzvah to what they want to change it. Once you give credibility to human reason, there's no end to where it'll go. Right? So even though I think Ramam is entirely right, nevertheless, and the Ramam, what I'm telling you, I think is, is what he meant, nevertheless, the Ramam also understands that there still has to be some authority or authorities that make the boundaries. We can't just let everybody, no matter how smart they are, just translate and interpret the way they want to interpret. Because then you end up with a religion that's not a religion, and people running in 55 different directions, unlike what we have today where everyone's so harmonious and everyone agrees. But you have to have some, some kind of authority. Raman felt, maybe he was overconfident in human beings, that people generally understood the boundaries. They understood that there was a capital T, there is a correct answer. The correct answer is a range of truths. The range of truths means God created the world. God gave us the Torah. God has prophecy. God could relate with us. God gave us mitzvot to fulfill. Anything that doesn't immediately conflict with reason is binding as it's written. So, for example, there's a question, there was a question raised about the creation of the world. The Aristotelian said the world is eternal. And Raman believed the world is created. Why did he believe the world is created? He said, because Aristotelians can't prove that the world is eternal. There's no philosophical proof. None of us was there. None of us know. So they use arguments. I can give you good rational arguments the other way. And plus it's important to say that the world was created because the Torah says, But he says, if it can be proven infallibly that the world is eternal, we would reinterpret, it, that the, reinterpret the Pasuk to say that God didn't create the world, but that God is eternal. Ramam gave reason tremendous power, but there's places reason... reason it's not relevant to it. Can't, can't explain. All those areas where reason cannot explain or cannot deal with or does not deal with, in those cases we follow tradition and we follow the uh, words of our sages from generation to generation. Now, Rambam's approach is a very difficult approach. It has confidence in people's ability to think. And not only does it have confidence in people's ability to think, it demands that we think. And in fact, if we don't think, and we don't think to our very best quality, then we're not in fact being religious. Rambam hated, hated, correctly so, superstition. And there's a very, very fine line between religion and superstition. I hate to tell you that. In Brooklyn, I'm sure this doesn't apply anywhere. <laughs> Only in Manhattan, it's other places. But there are people, he, 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 he has different cases. For example, the Mezuzah. Mezuzah, it's a to put a mezuzah on our doorpost. So he talks about people who take mezuzot, and they write names of angels, not my kind of angel, but little, the real angels in heaven. They write these names, and they, they treat the mezuzah as though it's a, a magical charm. That when they have a, a problem, they put their hands on, on the mezuzah, or they think that somehow there's some angels, by putting names of people or angels in the, in the mezuzah scroll, or on the outside of the mezuzah scroll, it gives an extra protection to the house. The Ram put this as a form of idolatry. This isn't religion. This is superstition. We don't believe in magic. We believe in God. And so sometimes you hear, again, probably not in this community, but other communities you hear, people say, if something went wrong, go check your mezuzah to see if it's kasher or not. They hear it. You hear it even here? Amazed. Amazed. Shocked. Yeah. Uh, all right. That's a Chabad's influence. The Rambam... As they say, if he were alive, he'd be twisting in his grave. That was supposed to be a joke. You got that? Yeah. Okay, good. No, that's not religion. God didn't give us a mitzvah. Or there's another thing, ala makah. First, they used, people used to say, pasukim, if, you're, if uh, there was a uh, wound. People used to say, little pasukim over the wound to cure it. Or if a baby was crying, they used to put a mezuzah on the baby. Or Torah, to be in something holy, so they shouldn't cry. The Ram says, these people who do this are not only fools, they're kofrim, they're deniers of God. And these people don't see themselves as deniers of God, they're taking the holy things. He says the Torah wasn't given for this purpose. This is a m- terrible misunderstanding of Torah. And Ram had no mercy on such people. Chazim kofrim meant they had no place in the world to come. The Ram didn't, he wouldn't have liked people to wear these little red uh, 
things around their, their red, things are, strings around their wrists. He wouldn't like a lot of things about modern Jews. He would have. I don't think he liked a lot of things about Jews in those days either. He's a tough guy. If he would have had a choice of being neighbors with Spinoza or Rambam, Ram, we probably would have liked Spinoza. He's a quieter guy, easier guy to get along with. Anyway, but what is, why is Rambam so emphatic about these things? Because he knows that religion can slip into a magical formula. People think of religion as a um, salvation. If I only say the right formula or do the right incantation, see, that's what pagans did. That's not what Jews do. Jews function with their brains. Jews want to find God, the capital T, through reason, through philosophy, through thinking. Not through jumping through mysticism, although he had his own concept of mysticism, which I'm not going to discuss tonight. But he did not like... Um, these Kabbalistic, what we call Kabbalistic or superstitious habits. So Rambam presents us with a way, I think, of trying to talk to the Spinozas of our generation. If I were Spinoza's real rabbi in 1654, before he was thrown out of the community, I would have sat down and learned Rambam with him. I would have tried to teach him that Judaism is a religion of reason. And now he apologetically so, but necessarily so. And Judaism is a demanding religion. I, my Uncle Vic, you remember Uncle Vic Shahan, he used to tell us, Judaism is a thinking man's religion. Today they have to modify it. Judaism is a thinking person's religion, to be politically correct. But in fact, that's what it is. It's not for lazy people. It's not for people who want shortcuts. It's not for people who want to do magic. It's not for the ignorant, as to use Ramans, or the ignoramuses of the law, who will follow the, the, the formulas without thinking why they're following, what these things really mean, and how they're supposed to impact on our soul, and how they're supposed to change us. So I would try to explain to, to Spinoza these things. If I would succeed or not, I don't know. But I think, for the sake of our children and our grandchildren, it's important that we take a more Rambam approach to Judaism. The other f- kind of Judaism inevitably leads to the following kind of characteristics. Authoritarianism, obscurantism, xenophobia, intellectual unsoundness, superstition. I could keep going on with all kinds of bad things. Let me give, give some examples of authoritarianism today, which again, I don't, I'm sure you'd never see these things here. There was a, a recent convention at the Rabbin, of the Rabbinical Council of America, a very wonderful organization with great rabbis in it, and they were addressed, I wasn't at the that convention, my son was there, and they were dressed by a very important Rosh Hashiva. And the Rosh Hashiva said as follows. Rabbis in synagogues, their job is to make people feel happy. Visit them when they're sick. Console them when they're mourning. Marry them off. Marry, bury, and whatever else you have to do with people. Make them happy. But when it comes to thinking, stay out of it. He said just like this. When it comes to real questions that are serious, you come to us. We'll give you the answers. When I hear things like that, I, 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 get, I get furious. Right now I look calm, but inside I'm boiling. Right? Why? What is the person saying basically? He's saying, you know what? Authority is centered in me, or a small circle of people like me. We do the thinking for the Jewish people. You're not authorized to think. You're authorized to be a nice fellow. But you're not authorized to use your own brain and make your own decisions. We want to constrict people's right to decide or to make decisions, to use their own brains and take responsibility. Another example, there's a thing called the National Council of Young Israel. The National Council of Young Israel, there's about a hundred young Israels around the country. There's, I think, one in Flatbush also. They're here and there in the next place. They made a new rule. For all these years, for many, many years, all the synagogues of young Israel, they could hire their own rabbis. Not anymore. What they have to do first is have the rabbi go to the Halakha Commission of the Young Israel, and the Young Israel Halakha Commission will decide, is the rabbi religiously proper for the synagogue? Is he religious enough? Does he have the right hashkafa? Does he have the right attitude? And they'll decide who could be your rabbi. What are they saying? They're saying, we don't trust you. We don't trust your minds, we don't trust your brains, we don't trust your judgment. We'll make the decisions for you. Who's the we? small clique of people who self-appointed themselves as saying we're the only ones who are smart enough to know who you can hire for your rabbi. We have problems with the 
chief rabbis in Israel, I'm not going to go through all of that. And other, other rabbinic groups that are saying, we basically don't trust people to make decisions. Not rabbis and not laymen. And we want to go only to a few selected gedolim, or people who are called gedolim, and they'll decide all the big decisions. And what's our responsibility? Our responsibility is not to think. Our responsibility is to follow the pattern. In other words, what they want us all to do is this. There's an algebra problem, and we have the answer. They say, just take the answer. Forget the process. We don't want you to think. Because you might come to the wrong answer. We already know the answer. We'll tell you what's good for you. When, as soon as that kind of a philosophy becomes predominant, that's the first sign of, of death. Mm-hmm. The first sign that we're already beginning a, a, a process of strangulation, intellectual, spiritual, and cultural strangulation. Because number one, who says they have the truth? Who says their judgment is better than ours? And number two, I think it isn't better than ours. I honestly think it's not better. We have... Um, we were in Israel this summer and we wanted to buy some cake. We go to the grocery store and every package of cake we find is Pashtachat Badaz Shel Ha'ilah Haredit. I wonder, do you know what the Badaz, the Beit and Tzedek of Ha'ilah Haredit is? Well, this summer I read a book. A book called the Ha'aredim by a man named Amnon Levi. And he wrote a whole book about the Haredim in Israel including a big section about the Eidah Haredit. The Eidah Haredit is basically a group that shares the Satmar philosophy. They're anti-Israel. They're anti the state of Israel. They're anti all of us who don't follow their ways. They have civil wars among themselves. They even called, for one Hasidic Rebbe, they didn't like, they even called, they gave him, they called a hit mat to kill him. Yeah. These, these people, every time you buy a piece of cake in Israel, you're giving them money. Right? And, and not only that, the, they have, there was an advertisement there's an advertisement in the, the OU publication in Israel. It says, go to the Ramada Renaissance Hotel in Jerusalem. It's under the best Hashkacha in Jerusalem. The Badats of the Edah Haredi and the OU. Look who the OU is in bed with. They don't see, and there's no problem. The Edah Haredi, they're, they're religious. They're from, because they wear black hats and they look very religious. They're insidious destroyers of the people of Israel. And, and even among themselves are killing each other. Literally and spiritually and figuratively. What? We, we lost our balance as a people. We don't even know what's right or what's wrong anymore. And those people who are in charge, the, the Rabbanut, who allows this to happen, by the way. Here's the odd thing. The Rabbanut in the state of Israel has a 100% monopoly on Kashrut in Israel, by law. And the only way the Badaz could function is if the Rabbanut gives them permission. The Rabbanut obviously gives them permission. And all of the companies, or many companies, they'd rather have the Badaz, they said, we don't trust the Rabbanut. When kids from, Israel, from the United States go to study in Israel for the year, one of the first things they're taught is, don't trust the Rabbanus Hashkacha, only find Badats. It's terrible. It is terrible. But, but who's making decisions for us? Who's thinking anymore? The answer is, we've entered a, an era, a twilight zone, when a self-appointed individuals are saying, we know best for you, and all the facts on the ground tell us they don't know best for us. What they're doing is not good for us, not good for the Orthodox Jews, not good for us as Jews at all. This morning I was discussing uh, different cases of people who uh, take uh, midrashim or statements in a very literal way and in a very weird way. So I, I'm not going to pursue this one too much, but for those who didn't hear it, there, there were, a few weeks back there was a, a conference in Washington, D.C. by a very, very right-wing Orthodox group and the rabbi in charge of the man named Rabbi Eisenstein, and in his speech he said, anyone who does not believe that the universe is 5,768 years old, who thinks it's older than that, that person is a heretic, the person is not a Jew, the person is not going to go to heaven, the person can't be a rabbi, the person can't perform weddings, the person can't sign his name as a witness, the person can't be a dayan, the person can't do a conversion, because he, does, he doesn't believe in a fundamental uh, principle of the Jewish people. This man is a moron. Pardon the intention. If he's here, I'll tell him the same thing. That's not a fundamental principle of our faith, that the world's 5,768 years old. There are many people greater and wiser than he who believe the world was billions of years old, who didn't think uh, the first day of creation was 24 hours. It was a period that could have been tremendously long. Who says? There wasn't even a sun or a moon the first uh, uh, two days, three days, right? So it wasn't, the Torah wasn't talking about 24-hour day, days. But regardless of that, and you'll find authorities also, 
But Rambam would say, if science could show in a reasonable way that the world is 15 billion years old, it's 15 billion years old. You don't have to teach people to be morons and not to, to accept the obvious facts of, of science. And, or to, to teach our children that the, when they see dinosaur bones, those aren't dinosaur bones, those are dog bones that were swollen in the, swollen in the flood of Noah. It's an outrage. A couple of years ago, our child is a good one. It's not so good. Our grandchild was studying in Manhattan Day School, which is a very good progressive modern uh, Orthodox school, and they were doing it in kindergarten. So he came home to show his grandmother, who teaches science in Manhattan Day School, um, a little booklet that they did in class about uh, Purim. So this is the Purim story. So there's Mordechai, and there's Esther, and there's Hashvi Rosh, and there's Haman, and then there's Vashti. And what's the picture of Vashti? Vashti has a tail, and she has pimples. So my wife asks the uh, asks the little uh, grandson says, uh, "Why did you draw Vashti that way?" Well, that's what we learned. Okay. So the next day, Gilda, my wife goes to the teacher of the kindergarten class. My grandson Jake came home with this picture. Why did you make a Vashti with a, a tail and with pimples? She says, "Didn't she have that? Doesn't everybody know that?" It's not in the Megillah, it's not written there. Well, that's why I learned it. So, Gilda asked other people, of course, everyone knows that Vashti had a a pimple and a tail. So, in fact, in fact, there's a Midrash that says that. But what does the Midrash, why does the Midrash say that? And what value does it, what value is there in teaching a a kindergarten student about that? I don't know. Although the kids like to have, I guess, things to make fun of. But the Midrash says that, that Vashti was a descendant of the Vuchad Netzar. The Vuchad Netzar was very, very bad. He was uh, responsible for the destruction of the temple. So therefore, everything about Nebuchad Netzar, in the, in the words of the Chazal, is vilified. So what happens is, if Vashti is a descendant of Nebuchad Netzar, we take it for granted she can't have virtues. So if she can't have virtues, now because she, she not have virtues, we have to make her ridiculous. So when... When she actually, if you just read this without knowing any midrash, and you saw that she was called to come before uh, the king, and she said no, you might be a feminist. Hey, good for her. She said, what a good she has. She's got guts. She doesn't listen to her husband. She stands. Uh, you might find some virtue in her. The Chazal can't find virtue in her on purpose. It's part of their literary style. Because she's from Nebuchadnezzar, she must be all bad. So how come she didn't appear before the king? She couldn't because she was ashamed of herself because she had pimples and she had a tail. So if you understand the Midrash, okay, the Chachamim were trying to say something. But if you don't understand it, you're teaching kids nonsense. Mm-hmm. Kids grow up and they think, some, the one of the things that everyone thinks is in the Torah is that Avram Avinu, when he was a little boy, knocked down all the idols. And they think that's in the Torah. It's not in the Torah. It's a good story. It has, has, has a meaning. Fine. But it's not in the Torah. Obscurantism. We were in Israel last summer, the summer where there was the second Lebanon war. And we thought, in our naivete, that the war was caused because Hezbollah uh, kidnapped some Israeli soldiers. That's what, in our ignorance, that's what we thought. But then we were made enlightened what the real reason was. The real reason was announced by the head rabbi of the Eidah Haredit why it really happened. Do you know why the war really happened? And why we were losing and why people got killed? The war really happened because there was supposed to be a gay parade in Jerusalem and we didn't protest enough against it. And Hashem was punishing us. That's a real reason for that war. A person says it, thousands of people cheer him, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands believe it, and the rest of us are puzzled. Who told this guy this? How does he have, I didn't know that we had prophecy in this generation anymore. And God, if he picked this guy to be the prophet, I worry about God. Very, very peculiar. We had a statement not that long ago by a, a very prominent Sephardic rabbi who I, I, uh, I won't... Uh, I'll say his name. It's Rabbi Ovadio Yosef. Who I sometimes... Based on his initials, we call him the Oi. O-Y, the Oi. Yeah. He's a great man. I, I don't, I'm not de- de- demeaning him at all. He's a great, great, great sage, great scholar. But he made the following statement. He says, We don't want women to talk. Women belong in kitchens. And women should not be involved in public life in any manner or form. And I know some of you may, may agree with that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But she, she said literally, women 
women belong in the kitchen, and that's it. We don't want you anymore. So, after he said this, there was a big tumult in Israel. Uh, how could this rabbi, a very important rabbi, how could he say such a thing? It's terrible. And all the women were upset, and, uh, and, and normal men were also upset. It was a whole kind of thing. So, uh, they came back to when they got, demanded an apology. So, he made, up a, he made another speech, not in which he apologized. But he says, we have to understand, the, the, our tradition teaches that, that women have a place, and it's important that the women stay in that place, and I'm only trying to help the Jewish family, and this is good for... for he, he has a right to his own sociological views on life. But he didn't apologize to anybody, and he basically reinforced what he said the first time. I'm not saying, I'm not going to stand in judgment, is he right, is he wrong? You can judge for yourself what you think is right. What bothers me is, a person who has that kind of status, and he's, there are a few in the world who have this kind of status, make statements which I think are very irresponsible, and they make it not just as, as their own personal opinion, they make it as this is the word of God. And this is something that's binding on all of us. If a person would come you know, honestly and say, you know, my judgment is that women's living is very bad for the Jewish people, and these are my reasons, okay, we'll agree, we'll disagree, but he's only saying it's my personal opinion. But when you make a proclamation, as though somehow you're speaking from a higher power, you're one of the Gedolim, and we're just schleps, we're not allowed to think for ourselves anyway, this is a very, very dangerous uh, syndrome. I'm just going to do one more, uh, one more category here, and then we'll wrap it up a bit. We read it also in the paper in, um, about a, a guy from the United States, from Teaneck, who went on Aliyah, he went into Beit Shemesh. So he opened a pizza shop. So he made the mistake of opening his pizza shop in a relatively Haredi neighborhood, and he allowed the boys and girls to go to the same pizza shop at the same time. <coughs> So people came and they started boycotting him, harassing him, throwing rocks at his windows. And he had another sin, by the way. There was another very important sin. He had, because he was from New York, he called, even though he teenaged, they, they tried to lean on New York also. He called it New York Pizza. He put it as a sign in front of his um, store of the Statue of Liberty. So they asked one of the Haredi rabbis about it. They made him take the Statue of Liberty down. Because liberty, no, not because it's an idol. Liberty is not a value among us. Liberty means freedom from, from, the, from the religious. Chofesh, chofshi. That is, we don't want it, we don't, for us, liter, li, um, freedom isn't the issue. Following the rules is the issue. So he, had a, he finally changed, he put up the Twin Towers. I don't know how that helps. <laughs> <laughs> it makes everyone sad when they eat pizza. All right, so maybe that's okay. I don't know. So he put the Twin Towers, but he's kept on having boys and girls being able to eat pizza in the same pizza shop at the same time. And the, but they, the, he's been boycotted. So he finally has decided he's going to move to another neighborhood, which is probably smart. But th- th- these kind of things are, are, are intimidation, all based on the ideas. There's a, a thought could police, there's a tenured police who know, who know how to think better than we do. We don't trust you to make decisions for yourself. We don't trust you to think. We don't trust you to find proper guidance. If you don't have the right answers, to ask the right people to, 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 to ferret out what will be the proper answer. This bothers me endlessly. It bothers me because I think there are a lot of people in the younger generation, not to mention in our generation, but younger generations, who, who might easily succumb to this kind of lifestyle and be happy all the rest of their lives. But there may be others, and I think there are plenty of others, who actually want to think. And they want to make decisions. They want to live responsible lives as responsible human beings. And they feel being, uh, being strangled. They feel that there's a, a, a thought mafia that's not giving them the opportunity to develop their own spirit, their own life, in a nice way. I'm not saying people should, God forbid, break out of the boundaries of the Judaism, of the Torah, Chas v'Shalom. But there's, the boundaries of the Torah are much wider and much more intelligent than is currently being presented. I'm just going to give a, a two-minute advertisement, and that's all. That's not more than two minutes. Uh, I've been talking about this during the course of this weekend, about a new institute I founded called the Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals. And all of you in your spare time, if you have spare time, go to the website. It's called jewishideas.org. The purpose of this website and the purpose of the organization is very single-minded. The single-minded is to describe and make people realize that within halachic Judaism, there's room for independence, there's room to think, there's room to grow, there's diversity of opinion which is legitimate. We don't all have the answer, we're striving for the correct answers. There's a range of correct answers for every problem, for most problems, for most questions. 
We're trying to stress the diversity of Sephardim and Ashkenazim, <coughs> the diversity of the history of our people, all within a framework to let people know that Judaism is a religion that when you, you don't feel like you're oppressed by Judaism, you feel, ah, oh, what a wonderful thing to be part of this. See, I, I think Spinoza needed this thing. If he had that website, maybe it would have helped him to realize Judaism is bigger than the, what the narrow thing that he was learning. To try to create a more rational and responsible Judaism. To try to make rabbis and laymen take more personal responsibility for their own lives and responsibility for their own communities. And not immediately say, oh, how can we possibly win? They have, they're more of them. They're in control of the mikvah. They're in, they're in charge of the kashrut. They're in charge of this. They're in charge of that. What can we do? Ladies and gentlemen, you could do something. <coughs> however much or however little, everyone can do something. And even if it's only to protest, or even to lodge a protest, even to tell your friends and neighbors, even if it's to share with your children and grandchildren, we have to build enough of a resistance to say we're not going to let people choke us up. We're not going to let self-appointed cowboys be our spokesman for Judaism. And therefore, my wish tonight, my, my, my last uh, comment for you tonight is, if you think anything I've said this whole weekend makes sense, and you would like to see these kind of ideas reach a much broader audience through, through print, through writing, through text, all kinds of different ways, then please join up with us. Help us out to make this institute uh, a big thing. I raised about a half a million dollars so far. My goal is to raise initially a million. And then after I get to the million, I want to have another two million dollar endowment that will have plenty of room to do lots of things. Today, one person made an interesting comment. Uh, correct, see, this is the community that they understand business better than I do. They said, in order to resist such a big operation, you need to have enough resources to do what you need to do. It's not enough just to talk in a corner, talk in this community, and talk in that community. We have to be able to publish lots of stuff and distribute lots of stuff and get into schools and get to the rabbis. It's an amazing process. It's going to take us a whole long time. And God willing, we'll see um, the fruits of our labors sooner rather than later. But it's something that has to be done. And to the extent that you can be part of that, I am grateful to you and I thank you. And to school them as well for everybody. Yes. yes. What to prevent the rabbis who join in and become part of this, and we do have a few, from being blacklisted as they have been in the past? You know what? I, I can't stop all of that. No, what I can no. do. What can we do to help them? What we can do is make sure that they have secure jobs. Many rabbis are afraid for their jobs. We have to make sure. Even if they have secure jobs. Then just you know what? If you just tell her, go hug your rabbi figuratively, right? <laughs> you gotta tell the rabbi, rabbi, we're with you. Right. Very often, rabbis feel alone because their own congregants don't let them know they're with them. So even if you just get chazak baruch, rabbi, we, I hope you stand up to this. It means a lot. It means a lot. Believe me. As one who's been in the field for a long time, I know that that a, a, a word at the right time of, of giving you confidence makes you say things or take stands you might otherwise not say, not take yes can I ask you a question you referred to the comments uh, about the rabbi talking about the reason for the war in Lebanon being the gay parade while to most of us it sounds almost stupid and, and infantile I, I have to ask a question you look at all the books of Nebim and Dishonim, from Shoftim, through Shemuel, through Melachim. And it's very clear that it's not a book of geopolitics. Every time there is some sort of oppressor, some sort of a Shoser, some sort of a problem, it's very, the Pesukim make it very, very clear that it's only because the Jewish people Sin. are not following God. That, that's it. You step out of line, you're going to get nailed. End of the story. It has nothing to do with the fact that Aram became strong or weak. The person or the, the nation that's invited in to do God's work is the chaussée du jour, and their role is their role, and once their role of being Shevet Apo is fulfilled, they retreat into nothingness. Mm -hmm. And the Jews hopefully learn their lesson and we move on. Right. So when, when we look at modern politics, now, we're missing that key element of an Avi telling us... Well, that's the answer. The answer is, if a person said, I had a Nebuah from the Rebosh Olam, and he was able to make a causal relationship between this particular tragedy and this particular sin, I don't argue with a Navi if I think the person's really a Navi. We don't have Naviim anymore. We just don't have Naviim. So 
So the people should have the humility to say, I'm not a Nabi. I might think that we're suffering for, uh, XYZ because of our sins, and we have plenty of sins. There was, I mean, a, a worse example, again from a, a great Sephardic rabbi, Rabbi Mordechai Eliyahu, who also got himself in hot water. He, said, he says that the reason there was a Holocaust, that 6 million Jews got killed, including 1.5 million children, is because there was a reform movement. You know what? I think it's arrogant to say that. I think, besides that, I think it's actually wrong and a disgrace to all these poor people who died in, uh, in vain. And it gives the Nazis a feeling we're only serving as God's messengers. Right? You know? Well, whatever it is. But I, if, if the Naviim say something, I'm not going to argue with the Navi. But in the case we don't have Naviim, people should have the humility to say, I don't know, and I'm not going to keep quiet. There's some, some modicum of self respect that we'd expect from people. One of, yeah. one of our rabbis used to, uh, every time somebody died and he spoke at a funeral, it was always because we did something terrible and bad, and that, otherwise that person would have lived. And it was devastating. The ultimate guilt trip. Stone, you know? <laughs> Don't go to any more funerals. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a, that's a real guilt trip. Always. Yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. What do you think of a rabbi who tells his congregation somebody in the congregation got cancer? Don't don't send that rabbi to me. I don't want him to join my group. <laughs> he wouldn't feel comfortable with us. You know, don't we? Don't, don't now, let me answer the question a different way. He says that he makes that statement in the presence of a few hundred people that, and the call. So what do the people say? Does anyone go to the rabbi afterwards quietly, not embarrassing him? The rabbi I found that very offensive. Does anyone talk to him? You'd be surprised how responsive rabbis could be if they had some feedback. Just like they should be praised when they do something good, they should be told in a polite way. You know, you crossed the line. You made people feel very bad. You made us feel guilty. You, made, you don't know if that really happened that way. And it hurt people in a very profound way. And since you're a rabbi, and of course you're interested in loving and kindness and compassion, and chesed, that was the wrong way to go about it. And if 10 people or 15 people would have told him that, he would be thinking very carefully before he tried that another time. None of these things should be done angrily. None of these things should be done in a showy way to embarrass somebody. But there's a whole lot that can be done quietly by individuals if they take the responsibility. That's what I was saying before. People have to take responsibility. And not just that's the way it is. It's not the way it has to be. Yes, Shlomo. Yeah, a certain rabbi who comes to you and you're the community, he's not part of the community. But he reads your palm and everything else. And he's making a donation and he'll give you a rabbi to do a keychain or a matchbox. <laughs> <laughs> he does all the time. You know what? Here's the thing. You know what? This, to my mind, this is paganism. And the only reason this guy is able to succeed is because people pay him the money to do it. If you, you know how to defeat the guy? Don't give him any money. If he had no customers, he couldn't be in business. He'd go someplace else. He's got to Manhattan where the people aren't as rational as they are in Brooklyn. I was speaking with my brother David before. There's a thing you probably get in the mail from uh, Gedolei Yisrael, whoever these people may be, that if you make a donation, Gedolei Yisrael will make a special prayer for you at the hotel. They call it the Koisel, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah the Koisel. And if you make a recommended donation, they'll make it even a special prayer for you. Give me a break. Give me a break. This is Judaism. These are Gedolei Israel. I can't pray to God straight. I've got to send money to this Shmo. Uh, in, in, I don't even know who calls himself a Gadol to make a prayer for me. What is our religion coming to? Our, our, what's, really, what's wrong with our, our, our own self-respect? Why do people send their money to this? Because they're desperate. I'm a she rest in peace. My mother was a beautiful lady, very rational, very sensible in many ways. And she did not believe in superstition. But I used to come home from Yeshiva. I lived in Seattle. So I'd come home, and my mother would put Ruda in my shirt. Ruda is a kind of a plant, a root. Among Turkish Jews, it's considered good luck. So I said, Mom, it's against Ayin Hara. I said, Mom, you don't believe in Ayin Hara. You don't believe in this. She said, no, Of course not. But just in case. <laughs> So very, so very often, you know, bless her soul, but many of us are very rational, but who knows, you've got to touch all bases. So you go to the palm reader, you, you send in a kvittel to the coast, the koisel, and you send it. So, but what I'm saying, we have to outgrow that. There's a generation, I understand, people did that, we came from the Middle East, we came from those cultures. Fine, I understand, no, no objection. But we have to wean ourselves from that. Yeah. Uh, I have a two-part question. Okay. <laughs> I got a little bit because I have a car coming at 10 o'clock for us. Um, 
Okay, so um, you talked about the reason and the fact that we should trust people, you know, using their reason and interpreting uh, passages in the Talmud and the Bible. And then you approached it, but I don't think we really fully uh, developed this uh, subject well enough about how we're going to safeguard against people using their reason inappropriately that could possibly damage Judaism, or quote unquote. The second thing, uh, the second part Good of question. Is, well, you, know, you approached it, but I think you backed off on it. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if that was intentional or not. And the second part of the question was, you, the human being is composed of a reason, reason fac- rational faculty and also maybe, maybe a metaphysical or, or spiritual or a super rational The Raman believed that too. Huh? The Raman believed that also. Okay, so if we're going to use our... Re- I mean, some... Isn't there a limit to using a reason that will sometimes not uh, meet the human being's need for the spiritual ascent? Uh, and ha- and how Let me answer the second one first because it's right on my mind. The Rambam also believed that human reason has its limitations. That's, that's part of the topic, uh, the title of the topic tonight: reason and its limitations. The Rambam knew reason could only take us so far. That's right. Absolutely, Rambam would be the first to say so, and he also believed that. Although he believed people could get prophecy, he thought it would be a rare, very rare thing. So, no, so he, there's a, like a, an area between the end of reason and the beginning of prophecy that is the spiritual fulfillment for all of us. And there has to be some kind of leap of faith. Raman, for example, describes how do you love God or fear God? You go out at the uh, starry night and you look at the stars, you see the heavens, you see the glory of God, and you, uh, I'm overwhelmed by the power of God. I feel an immediate sense of love for God. And then after you love God, you say, oh, how small I am. I, how, I'm nothing in this universe. And you feel a fear of God. But that's not reason. That's an emotional jump. So you have to have reason. But there'll be some, at some point, you I, I pass reason. Ram is perfectly in tune with that. So we need and to underscore that. A little absolutely, bit. good. Absolutely. Balance absolutely. Out, it's, uh, good. Now, the, my yeah, and the first part... The first part is this. The, 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 the answer to your first part of the question is this. Everyone should think on it, his and her own. Everyone should make his and her interpretations the best they can. But they should also recognize they're part of a tradition of thousands and thousands of years. And everything we do, we have to do with great humility. So, for example, let's say you're learning a Shulchan Aruch, you're learning a Ramah, you're learning Talmud, and you come with it, you think it's a great Hidush based on your own reason. So, the first thing you do is don't go publish it and say, I'm going to now change my, my way of behaving uh, because I, I came up with this great idea. What you're going to do is you're going to go to other people who are, may also know a lot. You consult, you learn with them, and you still, they all think it's good. Go to the rabbi, the rabbi will consult, the rabbi will study. He'll call his colleagues, he'll, he'll study, and eventually you'll find out what you said, someone already said in the 3rd century, someone already said in the 15th century, or it's really something new and fresh and interesting and to be thought about. But you don't just because you think something's true, it becomes truth. We have to have, um, as much as we have to have confidence in our ability to think, we have to have humility to know that there are limitations on, on our thinking. I, I don't act, recommend people to just say I can do whatever I want because I thought of it to be. So thank you for helping me clarify that. There's a question on this side. Excuse me. I'm trying to understand this historically. If the Rambam was a refugee from Iberia, okay. basically, he was born there and he had an integrated education of Aristotelian Everything that works. Archaeologic and is he, when he wrote, he was speaking to people of his generation. He was? They also had this integration and knew how to match philosophy with um, with religion and reason, you know, with emotion. And, I mean, he probably couldn't conceive of a time when the, the educational system would be broken down so much that we're a few hundred years later, you have Spinoza who also probably had a classical education, but already you see in Western Europe and Holland and England, they, like you thought, if you were his rabbi, they couldn't contain him. There was a breakdown of that old Sephardic style of learning and, and living. So are we now, has it broken down so completely that we're at the other end where we don't even know what we're really, we're talking reason. I have to admit, I'm the first person. What is Greek logic? What is reason? I, I really can't even get near it. Where I think most people, you know, would admit the same thing. So are we at a point where we have a co- complete polar end where Rambam started? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. the, the, the situation in Rambam's day, if you would look at well, the way he wrote it, he wrote about describing his generation in more bleak terms than we were describing our, our own generation. He thought that uh, he described the, the rabbis in, uh, in France, the Eskenazic rabbis, 
He said the only time they perceive God is when they smell vinegar and garlic. <laughs> <laughs> he had very low esteem for them. He had very low esteem and he calls the people who follow the misvote, he calls the people who follow, follow the misvote as ignoramuses of the law. He thought most of the people were, were pretty, pretty stupid. Just a second. And then you're talking, yes. And then you're talking, who did he write the guide for the perplexed for? He wrote guides for the, for the perplexed for these intellectuals who are having very big doubts and struggles. And they're trying to integrate. They didn't have a natural integration that Rambam had. They were having struggles with it. And Rambam was trying to keep them. That was his dialogue, dialogue with his Spinoza of his generation. There was a lot of questions, a lot of uh, con- conflicts in his time. It was not a smooth, serene, spiritual time. It was a very time of great distress, great ignorance, and great spread of, of uh, Arabic and Greek philosophy. So the Rambam was talking to us in a situation that isn't altogether different from what we have to face here today. Yes. So, but we're walking this fine line. We are. The man being Jews between rationalism and, uh, and respect for tradition. But I'll just bring it up because when, when it comes to women's issues in Halakha, there is no rich tradition to fall back on. We're coming from a place where women do not really have a place in the shore or in the community that they, you know, to build upon. So what do you do there when you need to have a radical break from the way things might have been done? It's a very good question. I can't answer it in full because it's too big of a thing. I'll answer just by giving one example. In 1919, there was a question in the, the emerging state of Israel. They just had, there were Jewish colonies there before the, obviously, 1990s pre, pre-statehood. And in, in most of the world at that time, in most countries, even in Western Europe, women couldn't vote. There was no suffrage at any place. <coughs> women's suffrage. There was a discussion whether women could vote in Israel for these community councils that they were forming. And not only could they vote, could they serve as the chair people. So when the question came to Ralph Cook, who was the Ashkenazic rabbi, great Ashkenazic rabbi, he says, he, he gave your answer. He said, if you look at the tradition, and he gave Rabbi Ovadi Yosef's answer, women belong in the kitchen, there's no tradition of women in leadership, women shouldn't vote, it's not sniut, women should not be involved in these kind of things. This is, this is men's business. But the same question came to Rabbi Uziel, the Sephardic rabbi, and Rabbi Uziel said, we have to start from a different angle. The angle is an ethical consideration. <clears throat> Can we require someone to follow laws if they themselves had no part in the process of these laws? Answer, no. It's unethical. Can we, then the next step, can we ask women to follow laws passed by the council if they had no vote, no say in it, and if they themselves couldn't even be elected? Everybody would just say, it's not possible to say that. So he found all kinds of sources, including from medieval Spain, where women did have um, roles in the community. And he gave a plaque that women could not only vote, but they could hold office. And he found, he found sources. And he, and he said even if those sources weren't there, this is a new, new territory, and we have to work from an ethical principle. So we do have, uh, in our, if we study our literature more carefully, we will find a precedence. And if there are no precedents, you'll find some very thoughtful people that are willing to take a step forward and cross the line to, uh, to, to break new ground. Is it, whenever you make a change, a sociological change that affects whole communities, it's always going to be very hard and slow. Because as soon as you do something that affects other people's lives, it annoys people. People are used to a certain habit, and they don't want to see other things. They, they, get, they get nervous if people are, are doing things in another way. So there's resistance, and it takes time. But just because it takes time doesn't mean it's not happening. It doesn't mean that there's not a, some kind of forward motion on these particular questions. I mean, there's a lot of books that are being written in articles about women in Judaism, and these books couldn't have been written 100 years ago. So I didn't answer your question in full, but just to let you know that there is thought about it, and, and it's, it is possible to, to, uh, to break ground. Uh, if you ask a question, I'll give one more question. Yeah, here. Why do you describe tonight very novel, very, you know, um, revealing, whatever, but... The, the other side also the right wing and we all have people in our family we have brothers sisters. how do we relate to them you know with love and compassion no no no, no. A tremendous divide you know here's the thing people think if you're this way or that way uh, we're, we're antagonists I am not an antagonist of anybody I love all Jews unqualified I even love the Satmar Rebbe I love everybody so now I, I don't choose and pick uh, my job is the Haftal Recha Kamoch I think is a very serious misvah and if it were easy to love everybody God would not have had to command me mm-hmm. to, to love people you already love it's easy to love people you can't stand that's the job <laughs> so that's what, that's what it's a misvah so my job isn't my job isn't to be an, just a second no it, we have to start with our philosophy 
This, I, I believe what I said to be 100% true the right way, the best way for all the Jewish people. I understand that other people have different points of view. Okay. I don't love you less because you think differently. I voted for Bush, you voted for Clinton. I said, okay, fine. So we can still love each other. You know what? You don't, so I, don't, I do not accept animosity based on different viewpoints. If you want to be, hate me, that's your, you're up to you. But I'm not going to hate you. You're welcome at my table. You don't want to eat? So I'll, I'll give you a, a cup of tea. But you're welcome. I'm not going to break ranks with anybody. Our philosophy has to be one of love and inclusion. Not one of animosity, not one of hatred, not one I can't stand you, even though we can't stand them necessarily. Especially when it comes to family members, we want to include everybody. I, I was at a conference recently, and I was, had to speak on a panel relating to how do we deal with children who go off the derech. It means the general people took that to mean who no longer follow the religious tradition in the correct way. But one of the panelists discussed it the other way, who became so right-wing, also off the of derech, off our derech. And he gave the following story, uh, Maser Shehaya, he was invited to the home of a great Rosh Hashiva in Israel. I uh, actually have studied under this man also when he was in the United States. Very great man. And he has six, seven kids, whatever it is. And they're all very fine religious Jews. And he was invited the student to, to come to his house for Shabbat. And we sat at the table. Everyone is serving. The wife is serving. Everyone's eating. And one of this rabbi's sons is there with Tim Foyle. He won't eat his own mother's cooking. So if that's my kid, I think my instinct would be to throw him out of here. But that, Rosh Shiva, you want to eat that? Eat that. Comfortable. I love you, you're my son. Call a kavod. You don't want to eat my food? It's okay. I, I'm not sure I'm strong enough to be that way either, to tell you the truth. I probably would have, I probably would have thrown the guy out. Yeah, but nevertheless, it was a, it was a point. I, I wouldn't have thought of that, but it's a point. You know what? I, it's more important to me that my son should be at my table, whatever he eats or doesn't eat, than that he should be somewhere else. I have to have that relationship with him. And he doesn't trust my kashut? Okay. Okay, that's just my question. What can I do? I love him all the same. I'm not going to stop loving him because he comes to a different conclusion. So I think if we operate from love, we can't solve all problems, I assure you. But it will be easier for us to cope with the, the situations that come up. We're going to have to stop the program now. Thank, thank you so much. I'd like to thank Rabbi Angel for coming and thank you all. Shabbat